Hi. Welcome to Introduction to Ethics. Um, uh, what is it? Phil 103, Section 7, uh, CRN 11817, uh, Winter 2015, Oakland University, College of Arts and Sciences, Department of Philosophy. That's all on the uh, syllabus, the boilerplate. Uh, my name is Grant Yoakum. I'll be your instructor for this course. This semester, um, I will be holding uh, on-campus office hours on Tuesdays and Thursdays between 12.30 and 1.30. Uh, you can find me in a glorified storage closet um, in O'Dowd Hall on the third floor, room 319. Uh, this course meets virtually, so I'm assuming that much of our correspondence is going to be via email. Um, but nonetheless, the on-campus office hours are probably the best way for us to communicate about this material because, um, well, yeah, for a variety of reasons, really. In terms of email um, correspondence, a fast typist might type something like 100 words per minute, uh, but we speak somewhere around the 250 word a minute range. So then on top of that, um, we are able to do question and response. You get your response immediately, um, So and not all of communication is verbal. So um, I think in-person meetings are the best. If this is absolutely impossible for you, um, I understand that the reason you're taking an on-campus or an online course is because you can't regularly and predictably make it to campus on time. Uh, we can also schedule a Skype meeting so that we can have this sort of question response um, kind of uh, virtual in-person kind of meeting. So um, nonetheless, these are all communication options for us. Um, so the purpose of this video is to just go over the uh, course syllabus and uh, just make sure that uh, the course policies, what's expected from you, and what the nature of the course is going to be are all clear. So um, email me, contact me, drop by my office hours if you have any questions whatsoever about what we are discussing here. So um, the, the subject of the course is ethics. Right. So basically what we are trying to do in this course is figure out and examine a number of methods of making normative or should claims. Right? You should do this rather than that. Right? Uh, the history of Western philosophy is rife with attempts to establish substantive should claims. That is, uh, grounded, reasonable, um, authoritative claims for you should do or you should not do. Right? So um, that is going to be the name of the game. Uh, the course cat catalog description um, reads, Major ethical analysis of right and wrong, good and evil, from the ancient Greeks to present, appeals to custom, theology, happiness, reason, and human nature, will be examined as offering viable criteria for judgments on uh, contemporary issues of moral concern. Offered every semester satisfies the university's general education requirement in the Western civilization, uh, knowledge exploration area, and it's a four credit hour um, course. Um, the, the course objectives in Gen Ed, um, it, it stress your ability to critically analyze and develop um, arguments in both written and verbal form. Um, in this context, mostly what we are going to be able to do is to uh, work on your ability to write arguments and critically ana analyze arguments um, of the ethical kind uh, in your writing. So uh, that's largely uh, what uh, we are going to be up to. Um, so this is an online course. Uh, a lot of, uh, most of, 90% uh, of the, um, the, the, the course will be delivered in this manner. Um, so I will be recording or uh, relying on old recordings of uh, it, it's sort of lecture videos that I'll post to YouTube and give you a Moodle link uh, to. So uh, you're responsible for that. Um, and just so it's not just the Grant Yoakum show, uh, what I will be doing when possible is supplementing with other video material uh, because uh, quite a lot has been um, 
produced uh, surrounding this kind of material. So uh, for the first section of the course um, on Plato's five dialogues, we'll be taking a look at two of the five dialogues, uh, the Apology and the Crito. Um, I'll be supplementing this with a couple of uh, analyses provided by people other than me, so um, it's not just me. Uh, so that's what we will do. Uh, now, um, there are actually quite a few uh, textbooks required for this course. Um, it, it, a lot of them are available online, but um, I will caution you because I do throw out page references. Uh, so if you have the same books that I have, then we're able to follow along with one another. All of these are at the uh, Oakland University Bookstore. I think we're still Barnes and Noble. Um, and I've tried the labor to make them fairly cheap. Um, so this is your stack of books for the course. We'll be starting with um, Plato's Five Dialogues. And uh, like I say, don't freak out because um, I've got seven books listed for this course. Uh, we're reading two dialogues out of the five dialogues, like I say, the Apology and the Credo. Um, that will be enough to introduce you to the figure Socrates. I know the title says it's by Plato. Um, that's because Socrates never wrote anything down. And largely what we have about Socrates comes from Plato and a few other sources. So, um, Socrates is the first section, and you find it in the Plato's Five Dialogues book. And, um, the next book that we will be turning to is uh, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. Um, it's sort of a lengthy book, um, but we will just be looking at uh, books one and two and a small section of uh, book three of the Nicomachean Ethics. That should be sufficient. Uh, to give you a fairly well-rounded uh, introductory understanding of uh, virtue ethics as presented by Aristotle in uh, the Nicomachean Ethics. Um, after that, we will be moving to uh, Immanuel Kant's Grounding to the Metaphysic of Morals, and uh, we'll be the one who uh, enters therein, um, actually, as the preface, uh, the translator's preface to this book reads. Um, but nonetheless, this is probably the hardest and one of the thinner books that we will be studying. Um, this is uh, going to explore what Kant calls deontological or um, duty-oriented ethics, right? It's in uh, the intention and in the duty that the, uh, the, the ethical judgment finds its moral worth. Right. Um, then uh, we will be turning to uh, two books uh, by a fellow by the name of John Stuart Mill. I'm not trying to be a jerk with um, lining up Mill in this fashion. Uh, his utilitarianism sets up in very general terms and uh, defends his moral position, uh, which is, uh, as we'll see, I'll be supplementing Mill with um, lectures from a fellow by the name of uh, Rick Roderick and uh, another fellow by the name of Michael Sandel, um, who does one on Kant as well. Um, it's, uh, the Sandel lectures are from Harvard, and uh, the Roderick lectures, he was a professor at Duke who since passed away. But um, utilitarianism is, uh, it, Sandel's going to present it as um, a form of cost-benefit analysis, right? It's end-oriented or teleological ethics, right? That which produce, produces the greatest good or happiness or avoids the most pain, right, is to be what's considered good, right? So, um, uh, more or less, uh, this is a cost-benefit analysis uh, focused on the outcomes of our actions rather than, like Kant, on the moral quality of the intentions that lay behind the action in the first place, on the principle that lays behind the action. So, um, utilitarianism. You might think about this like Batman's utility, utility belt, right? What's it good for? The answer is all sorts of things. It's, it's handy. It's, it's, it's fit to attaining the ends or the goals that Batman sets up for himself. Silly examples, you'll have to get used to them, but nonetheless, uh, we'll be taking a look at the first three sections. They're short. You see it's a little pamphlet of a book here. Um, and uh, then we will be supplementing with the first section of Mills on Liberty, which is a political reformulation of uh, Mill's ethics, right, where he adapts um, and adds a couple of principles to supplement and perhaps um, 
combat uh, some of the potential problems that come from um, interpretations of uh, utilitarianism. So um, it's, it, this should illustrate to you that ethics and politics can be, and I think should be, um, closely tied with one another. Uh, political systems are put there in place uh, to be, you know, things that further our ethical goals, right? So this is why we demand of our politics, or try to demand of our politics, that they be fair or just or what have you. Um, we'll start talking about this early, uh, even with Socrates. Um, so, uh, what we've done uh, so far, um, just in terms of the texts that I've introduced, uh, are uh, ancient philosophy and uh, with uh, Socrates and Aristotle, and then to the modernist with um, Kant and Mill. And then we move to um, sort of a contested term. Uh, it's a lot of theorists. Um, a book off the shelf right now. Um, it, Habermas among them uh, dispute that there is such a thing as post-modernity. But nonetheless, um, if if you buy that there is such a thing as post-modernism, um, oh, well, it, these are two of the forerunners that we're going to turn to at the end of the course. Uh, Frederick Nietzsche and his Beyond Good and Evil, um, it's actually a criticism of just about every ethical theory that comes before. Um, so uh, what we are going to do after introducing ancient and modernists' attempts to ground a normative claim is to turn an extremely critical view um, er, an ex extremely critical gaze on uh, these attempts to ground a normative judgment. Nietzsche thinks that we are up to something categorically different when we um, foster a judgment, right? So um, it's, he's going to uh, reject reason, he's going to reject the notion of truth as it pertains to ethics, and actually offer us a different moral measuring stick altogether. And uh, finally, Jean-Paul Sartre um, is about the clearest of the theorists to um, introduce, isolate, and explore one of the themes that's going to permeate this, this, this class. Um, he is uh, an existentialist and um, a rather noted philosopher for freedom. Right? Um, so we'll be concluding with um, about half of this book. It's about 51 pages that we're um, going to be taking a look at. But um, I like concluding with Sartre because it actually demonstrates to you that ethics as a field of study and as um, sort of an aspect of human interest only makes sense on the basis of freedom. So in general terms, what this course is going to do is um, it's, it's not going to be pedantic or um, judgmental or anything along those lines. When we study ethics, it's the study of how best to manage our freedom. Right? And um, Sartre's a, a rather extreme existentialist position uh, should um, introduce uh, as, as, as clearly as any of these theorists, more clearly than any of these theorists, uh, this aspect of freedom as central to ethics. Uh, though, like I say, it's present in Kant and Mill and to some extent in Socrates and Aristotle as well. So, um, what I've done uh, in selecting these texts is to traverse about 2,500 years of ethical theory. Right. And uh, it, in terms of that 2,500 years, the best that we're going to be able to do is sort of spot check. Um, there are blind spots in this course, um, and uh, but nonetheless, I, I think I've picked uh, six figures. I can't do more if we don't have the time, but um, six figures that are fairly representative of a conceptual arc, a historical change in the way that we consider good and evil, right and wrong. Um, and the nature of these should claims. So um, don't panic uh, just because uh, these are your books. Um, there are seven of them, but uh, like I say, it's two out of five dialogues that we're reading here. It's three out of ten books that we're reading here. 
uh, it's roughly half of this little thin pamphlet here. Um, he's difficult, so uh, we are going to have to go carefully through um, Kant's ethics. Um, it's not the complete of either of these arguments. It's the the first three sections of one and uh, the first section of the second. Um, uh, we're just looking at the first two sections, the preface and the section one and two of Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil, and about half, 51 pages of this. So I've tried to keep the reading reasonable. <coughs> Here's the thing about how philosophers read. Um, it, you might note that my office is um, surrounded on all sides by books and more books and more books. And uh, believe it or not, I've got, okay, let's calm that down, um, a ton more books in storage. Um, so we read a lot, but um, maybe not as much as uh, literary theorists or um, people who study literature generally, right? Um, because what we are trying to do is come up with a very well-grounded uh, understanding of how each colon, period, question, mark, and paragraph break actually work, right? So uh, the goal is not a breadth of reading, but rather to focus in on reading fewer words, fewer arguments very, very closely, right? Because uh, language, language as we use it, tends to be sort of an awkward instrument for uh, working precisely uh, with ideas. Right? So um, interpretation and um, the, the very close reading of these texts is going to be quite ne quite necessary. So brace yourself. Um, some of what I'm going to be instructing you with regard to uh, may seem uh, nitpicky, but nonetheless um, close, clear understanding and close, clear writing that um, as expressively and as, as, as accurately, specifically um, as possible is going to be very important to uh, developing the kinds of understanding that philosophy is aiming at, and specifically ethical philosophy. Because it, think about it in your own life. In your own life, what you find is that it generally when you get into sort of a, a, a moral dispute with somebody else, uh, just think about text messaging and the kind of moral disputes that come up as a result of text messaging. Right? Uh, the interesting thing that happens is that it, we misinterpret one another or um, it misinterpret ourselves as we are texting and trying to represent ourselves through language, through text messaging. So conflict occurs as a result of our perhaps um, shoddy ability to express ourselves or interpret that which is being expressed to us. Right? So a good hunk of this class, as um, evidenced by the learning objectives for Gen, Gen Ed, has to do with presenting a clear account of ourselves and being able to interpret the accounts that are presented to us right, and is in as critical and concise a manner as possible. So um, that's going to be the name of the game. Now, um, you're probably curious how I'm going to grade you for this course. Um, uh, well, it's, I've written up a, um, a, a course description here. I'll leave that to you to read. Uh, we are on page one of the syllabus. But um, I will just go through uh, the, the grade breakdown, where, where your grades are coming from. Um, first off, note that the, t the percentage is total to 100. So um, I'm going to line up the points for each of these um, uh, assignments uh, in, in terms of the discussion forums, the writing assignment, the quizzes, that sort of thing, so that your points uh, line up with your percentage points as well. So all of the points for this class add up to 100 as well. That way it will be simple, simple, simple math for you to determine exactly where you stand in this course. There are four sections that um, it describe where your grade comes from. Uh, firstly, section quizzes, um, uh, one for each unit, six in total, and these will be graded out of 10 points for 10% of your final grade for a total of 60 
points or 60%. So 60% of your grade comes from these quizzes and roughly, not exactly, but roughly um, every two weeks we're going to be having one. Um, so on the, um, the what third to fourth, or, well, no, third page of your syllabus, it will give you all of the dates for all of these quizzes. Um, it, my advice is sit down, write them down in a calendar. Uh, I've decided this semester the quizzes um, it, on the week where we're having a quiz I post on Thursday and they were due to Moodle on uh, Sunday by 5 p.m. That doesn't mean that you've got to blow your Saturday or your Friday or your Sunday on them. I'll post them fairly early in the morning on Thursdays and if you can do them right away, do them right away. Right, and enjoy your weekend. So um, everything in this course is designed so that you can manage your own schedule and manage your own time. So um, this should be very workable for just about any schedule. If you've got time generally to do the course, uh, the deadlines are flexible enough that you can plan ahead and um, meet those deadlines around uh, uh, your schedules. Right? So uh, there are going to be 10 of the or Six of these quizzes were 10% each. Um, on page two of the syllabus, I describe what I'm up to with these, uh, these quizzes under the evaluation section. Section quizzes. This course is divided into six sections. Each of the quizzes for this course uh, will, um, will test uh, the section that we're working on only. That is, these quizzes will not be comprehensive. Each quiz uh, will consist of questions totaling to 10 possible points, um, usually one, two, or three points per, per question, and the rule of thumb is one sentence per one point. Right? Um, that's just a rule of thumb if you need more to explain what you're, it's, it, it take as much as you need, right? But um, if if I'm asking you to um, it, it, it define two things, it's generally a sentence for each. Right? So uh, that's a rule of thumb. Um, so uh, 10 possible points. Uh, typically, five short answer questions for two points each, asking you to define a term um, or uh, make an important distinction uh, related to a particular philosopher. Uh, these questions are designed to test both reading comprehension, so you have to read the textbooks, um, and a more general understanding of the ideas that we have studied, uh, that is, the readings and all of the video material are fair game for these quizzes. Uh, these quizzes will be posted to Moodle on the Thursday, ending each section covered by the quiz. Uh, you will have until the end of the weekend, Sundays by 5 p.m., to submit your responses. Due dates, um, you find those on page three. Uh, no late assignments will be accepted. Um, yeah, it, it, there are important caveats to that, but nonetheless, um, it's important that we all stay up to date. Um, it's I, I have a lot of students in these uh, the, the various classes. This isn't the only section I'm teaching right now. Um, so uh, this is all scheduled so that your work is doled out to you in a reasonable uh, manner that you can keep up with. And it, then I get the work from you and do my work in a reasonable manner that I can keep up with as well. So um, just to be fair as possible to the both of us, it's important that we stay up to date with these quizzes, right? Um, so that's the first thing that we talk about. Next, um, there will be a discussion forum for this class. Um, the, the discussion forums um, it will uh, be laid out in topics that relate to each and every one of the figures that we discuss um, in this class. Right? So if I assign you readings, I assign video material for it, it will be accompanied with a discussion topic in which I ask you um, some sort of interesting question. Um, it, it, Sometimes I post videos to explain further why I think the, the question is an interesting question, but nonetheless. Um, yeah, so, it's uh, again, on page two, I'll just read the description. Um, each figure we study will be accompanied with a discussion topic posted to Moodle. Um, you are expected to enter into debates, offer criticisms, and generally discuss the nuances of the theoretical positions of each of these figures via the Moodle forum. That is, you're graded on 
and also the completeness of this. You have to be engaged with each of these forum discussions. Um, at the end of the semester, grade out of 15 points uh, will be assigned based on the frequency, relevance, and quality of your participation. For example, posts like, I agree, or this is stupid without additional comments, or discussion will be uh, insufficient to garner a passing grade. Uh, it's perfectly acceptable if you post, uh, if your post is a response to another student. So um, if a student has uh, asked a question or offered a criticism or an analysis of a position and you respond to that in some sort of substantial manner, uh, that's perfectly acceptable as your response to the discussion forum. Right? Um, it's also perfectly acceptable to ask a question about sections of the readings or the more opaque nuances of the positions that we're studying. Right? So, um, it, it, for example, if we're studying Socrates and um, it, you're having a discussion about uh, the, the, the faculty of reason as it pertains to Socrates' sort of weird position, Right. Uh, it, it's possible to um, ask a question. Hey, I'm not really understanding blah blah yakety schmackety, and have other people respond to you. Right. Um, so uh, it, you know. So this is this is one of those great um, areas in the class where you don't have to so much be right or know the answer to succeed, uh, but rather this is this is your workspace, and I'm issuing a grade based on uh, how you're using your workspace. Right? Um, so illustrative examples that you could clarify or call question to the arguments presented by a specific figure are an excellent way to engage with this study resource. Right? So for example, here's Socrates' position. Here's this example. Socrates does not be, seem to be able to handle this kind of an example. Right? Or here is a great example of how Socrates' position actually works. Right? So um, these, these are good ways to engage uh, with the discussion forum. Um, uh, so uh, generally the idea here is to enhance your understanding of the course material. This is a study resource. This is your workspace for working through um, these, these books that um, are all of our concern to come to some form of understanding with. Right? So in a sense, um, these books are fairly cheap. This course is fairly expensive. One of the things, in addition to like me, who's read and studied all of these books, um, that you get is a think tank of 20, uh, 25 people who are all concerned with understanding the same material. Right? So the forums are a good way for you to collaboratively enhance your understanding of this material. Right? Um, so I asked myself three questions when I assign um, grades for these forms. One, have you posted at least, and I underline at least, um, once for each topic? More is better. The idea is to foster an ongoing conversation about the issues raised by the material at hand. Two, are the posts substantial? That is, uh, do, uh, do the, the posts offered uh, show engagement with the material? Right. Um, I, I look for evidence that you've read the material, evidence that you've spent a little bit of time thinking about the material. Um, also, are they substantial insofar as you've engaged with other people in the discussion in the forum as well? Right. And then finally, um, are the posts timely or did the student wait until the last minute to do them all? That points up something about this discussion forums. I leave them open all semester. All right? So when you get a new topic on a discussion forum, that topic remains open until the day and the time that you are submitting your final materials for this course. I do that for two reasons. One, I like to give you control of that portion of your grade right up until the last minute. All right? So um, sometimes Philosophy is a weird course to be taking, and it's different than biology or history or um, political science or what have you. So sometimes it takes people a little bit of time to find their legs in this course. The discussion forums are a great way to supplement your grade that's 15% of your final grade that you have complete control of right up until 
the very last minute in this course. Right. So, um, so that's that's one reason. The other reason that I leave these open all semester is because sometimes by um, the second to last section or the last section with SART, right, what you'll find is, oh, I just had an idea that pertains way back to Socrates or Aristotle. That's not coincidental. All of these guys are engaged with each other's arguments. They all, to some degree, have to handle the theory that's come before them, right? So, it, the history of philosophy is dialectical, right, insofar as it's one long, running, critical, adaptive conversation about the issues that surround ethical theory in this case, or theory generally, in the case of philosophy generally, right? So, um, for pedagogical reasons, for practical reasons, for, um, you know, theoretical reasons, it's important that you have access to all of these forms right up until the last minute, right? So, um, that's what I do. Right, um, but I do notice if there is a last-ditch effort to do all of the forms on the last day, right? Because uh, that what that does is it runs counter um, to the goal of the forum, which is supposed to be a long-running conversation between you, the students, using it as your workspace. Right? If it's just treated as a requirement or an exercise that you have to do, well, it's not really providing benefit to the other people who are trying to use that as a study resource as well. So um, so those are the discussion forms. That's 15% of your final grade. You see, we're 75% of the way there. Now, um, I'm, it, I've taken to, I've reintroduced a final writing project um, for this course. Uh, I've weighted it this semester at 20% of your final grade. It's um, roughly a four to five page um, reflection paper right, uh, that uh, you will uh, be engaging with. Again, page two of the syllabus, I described this. Uh, this will be a 1,000 to 1,250 word reflection paper directed towards uh, a choice between three course overview questions. So throughout the semester, I will be formulating, watching your discussions on the forums, um, thinking about the material and about the art that we're building. Um, and I will try to isolate three general questions that address themes that have become interesting to us in our discussion of this material. So come the end of the semester, actually I will be posting the uh, overview questions just before reading week um, to get you thinking about these questions and thinking about the writing ass assignment early. Right? So, um, these questions will be general and will relate to overarching themes within the course. I'll be formulating these questions throughout the semester. Uh, they may reflect forum discussions, themes from the readings, or material from the video content provided. Questions themselves will be extremely general and will likely require refinement for your particular reflections and arguments. These questions will be posted midway through the semester to give you enough time to workshop your project or project topic ideas. Um, so um, it, the idea is uh, what I've done in past semesters and I'm doing again this semester because I like it, I think it's productive, is ask you towards the midpoint to the end point of the semester to try to think generally about the course. Uh, what you will be doing for this writing assignment is picking two of the theorists that we've studied and using them to reflectively and critically engage with one of the themes that is um, one of the overarching themes of the course. Right? So uh, the writing assignment is where I ask you, uh, what do you think about these issues pertaining to ethical theory that we've studied in the course? Right? Um, so it's, I'm not asking for the earth, the sun, and the moon with this paper, like I say, four or five pages, uh, where you just show me what you've taken from the course, what you've learned, um, and uh, actually cut your teeth on formulating arguments with regard to this theory as well. Right? Um, related to uh, this, this, this writing project, um, for 5% of your final 
great. Um, I did this as a bonus last semester, and um, there was a lot of great inflation that went along. Um, I found it helped the people that didn't really need the help and didn't help the people that really didn't need the help, right? So um, I've made this a requirement, um, and uh, so uh, what, I've, uh, what I've decided to do is open up a writing project proposal forum, right? And assign five points um, to uh, the, your writing proposals. Unlike the other forums, which I leave as your workspace, you see me posting very infrequently on the discussion forums for this class, uh, I will post more frequently on your writing proposal um, forum, right? especially if there are good questions or good issues raised with regard to the, and, and the goals of this writing project. But nonetheless, um, the idea here is for you to workshop your paper topic ideas um, collaboratively with one another. So, I described on page three of the syllabus. Uh, writing project uh, proposal form, WPPF, we can call it, all right? Um, this form space will be opened up midway through the semester and is intended as a public space to collaboratively workshop your project topics. Your post should be sub, uh, substantial argument plans uh, for your project and not just one or two uh, sentence topic presentations. The idea with this form is to get you thinking about and planning your writing project early. Uh, here you're also expected to help other students uh, workshop their arguments with respect to the assigned topics. And um, one thing I have to say, once you post on this forum, you're not obligated to um, your your post, right? You don't have to cash out your post, right? So what I note here is that um, once you post your proposal, you're not obligated in any absolute sense or to it in any absolute sense. You're allowed and encouraged to change your mind as you think through your topic and your argument. In fact, refinement of your position and alterations to your thesis claims often is a sign of success and progress, right? So um, it's unlike just about all of the final materials for this course, uh, this forum is going to close at the end of the last week of classes in preparation for the tabulation of final grades. There's a lot coming in in the last week of classes. Um, the rest of your discussion forums, um, your, uh, your final papers and your final quiz all come in and here's, here's the wrinkle. I have to turn around and get everything graded for not just this one class but the several that I'm teaching within 48 hours of your submission. So uh, that is extremely, extremely quick um, with regard to reading a paper, grading a quiz, tabulating all of the final grades, going through the rigmarole of posting those final grades as well. So um, I need to uh, be able to tabulate at least some of this in advance uh, in order to actually meet that deadline. So that's why that closes when it does. Um, yeah, no, it's just, it's largely a place to reflect about your reflection. So it's um, a, a term that you'll, it's meta, right? It's sort of a meta-reflective workshop space that you're going to have here. So um, that is uh, how uh, you're going to be graded for this course. There, like I say, there are four major sections, uh, six quizzes totaling 10% each for a total of 60%, um, discussion forums for 15% of the class, where you reflect and get into conversations about the issues surrounding um, the, the, the material that we're studying, uh, the writing project proposal form pay, uh, participation for another 5%, and then your final writing project um, in lieu of a final exam uh, for 20%. Right? So that totals to 100. So any one given section, if you got 8 out of 10 on a quiz, you know that's 8% towards your final grade in the class, right? So um, simple math to figure out where you stand and away you go. Um, so what shall we do next? Uh, let's do um, uh, the general policies. And um, it, like I say, this is the 
first, uh, it, it, this is my least favorite part of um, any in producing any sort of introductory course, uh, it is um, the general policies. Each of these policies are here because I've had problems in the past. Um, my syllabus is growing and growing and growing as a result. I've got a cat trying to get into my office. I have cats, by the way. It, you'll, you'll figure out um, that. It's, I use them as examples to explain materials sometimes. You'll even meet my old cat, Sheldon, in a couple of the videos, I think, Aristotle and Socrates. Anyhow, um, general policies. First one we come across is plagiarism. I've had major issues with plagiarism um, at the various universities that I've um, taught at um, in Michigan and in Ontario. I'm a Canadian, by the way. Uh, so I'm a commuter to Oakland, only not so much for these online courses. Um, that's one of the benefits of teaching these online courses for me. Um, it saves me a drive into school. Um, so plagiarism, um, it's what I've done is I have quoted directly from the student handbook, and you'll notice um, there are a couple of footnotes on uh, this syllabus. Uh, the first footnote uh, references uh, the Dean of Students Office and the student handbook, which you're obligated to anyway. Um, it offers uh, the school policy on plagiarism. I'll just start by reading that. Plagiarizing the work of others. Plagiarism is using someone else's work or ideas without giving that person credit. By doing this, a student is, in effect, in effect claiming credit for someone else's thinking. Whether the student has read or heard the information used, the student must document the source of the information. When dealing with written sources, a clear distinction should be made between quotations, which reproduce the information from the source word for word within quotation marks, and paraphrases, which digest the source of uh, information and produce it in the student's own words. Both direct quotations and paraphrases must be documented. Even if a student rephrases, condenses, or selects uh, from another person's works, the ideas are still the other person's, and failure to give credit constitutes misrepresentation of the student's actual work um, and plagiarism of another's ideas. Buying a paper or using information from the World Wide Web or Internet uh, without attribution and handing it in as one's own is plagiarism. That's how the student handbook defines plagiarism. Essentially, what plagiarism is, is, um, it, well, it's two things. One, it's misrepresentation. You're saying, hey, I thought this, when in fact somebody else thought this. You're grabbing somebody else's ideas and misrepresenting yourself. So you're being disingenuous right off the bat. In the context of an ethics class, this should give us pause right off the bat, right? But on top of that, what you are doing as you claim credit for someone else's thinking Right? which if you're submitting something for credit in this class, what you are doing is claiming that these are your thoughts, your ideas, and you should be given grades which have a social value, material value, um, economic value, being given grades for those ideas which are not your own. So essentially, right, it's a rather offensive case of theft. Right? So, um, plagiarism is a major problem in academia. Right? Um, which example shall I use? Well, first off, let's start off by um, saying that I've had over 50 cases of plagiarism throughout my 10 years teaching at Oakland University. Yeah, it's been 10 years already. Um, over 50. Right? Almost every single semester that I've taught it, it's, I come across a case of plagiarism. I've got a wacky knack for detecting it, right? It's like I've got some sort of spider sense, right? That ding, 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 yeah, that's case plagiarism. And then what it does is it costs me time and energy because I have to, in a sense, prove that it's plagiarism in order to pass it on to the Dean of Students office. But it also puts me in sort of a weird position because my contract and my position at Oakland University considers me an expert with regard to how well you understand this material. But 
Uh, my contract and my position at Oakland University does not consider me to be an expert and an authority with regard to the authorship of the material. So if I suspect a case of plagiarism, I have to pass it on to the Dean of Students Office. In addition to this, plagiarized material puts me in a weird position because I'm asking myself, well, how well do you understand this material? And if it's plagiarized, if it's not your thoughts, your ideas, your words, right, then I don't know. I, I can't grade the material because I don't know how well you understand the material because you haven't given me your own words. Right? So it presents a big sort of problem within an academic institution, this, this plagiarism, especially since uh, the currency in a university education is ideas. Right? So, if you, it, it, so basically what a plagiarized plate paper is, is it's counterfeit currency. Right? So um, Oakland University takes a very hard stance against this, as do I. Right, so I'm sort of a tough cop on plagiarism. Um, so it's my course policy um, it is zero tolerance on plagiarism. Right, so um, you remember I was introducing John Stuart Mill calling it a form of uh, cost-benefit analysis in utilitarianism. My course policy is to help you out a little bit with your cost-benefit analysis when determining whether you should control C and control V, your way, well, command C, control, command V, in an Apple kind of context, your way through this course. Zero tolerance policy on plagiarism. Any student of, uh, suspected of this form of theft will be automatically passed on to an academic review board that's in the Dean of Students office. Um, they know me well. Right? I'm on a first name basis with the Dean of Students. It's quite nice, actually. But, um, and I should point out, that's just what my contract says I have to do. Right? I'm contractually obligated to pass it on there. Right? Um, uh, expulsion from the university is possible, right? um, it, 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 as well as um, suspension, um, any number of other sanctions, um, probation, that sort of thing at the university uh, level. Uh, that's what the board decides. But if it's passed on to the Dean of Students Office, and if the Academic Review Board determines that it is, in fact, a case of plagiarism, my course policy for this um, offense will be the automatically fail. Not the assignment, not the section, the course, the entire course for a case of plagiarism. So the idea is not to do it. Right? Now, the first ethical issue we encounter in this class, um, it, it, and precisely the reason I hate this section of uh, introducing you to introduction to ethics, sort of meta-introducing you, uh, I hate actually having to do this whole rigmarole on the course policy on plagiarism because I don't know you. You haven't done anything yet. You haven't done this we haven't transacted, I haven't looked at your work, you haven't presented me with any work yet. Right? You haven't done anything, but it, the fact that I've had these problems in the, um, the, the, the past puts me in a position where I've got a finger wave at you and sort of pre-criminalize you in advance of any of your activities. So that said, plagiarism is a big deal, I've got hard policies on it. The policy is only here because of past problems. I don't necessarily anticipate any present or future problems with plagiarism. Maybe we'll have no issues, and if that's the case, I'm happy or happy everybody goes on with their lives. Right? But if, if I do come across a case of plagiarism, it's, it's, it's sort of a, a, a throw the book at it kind of situation. So don't do it. You're happy. I'm happy. We live happily ever after, if that's cool. All right? Anyhow, um, that was meant to scare you a little bit. Now, now I get to be a nice guy. All right. um, uh, the missed assignment policy. I'm the first to understand that life happens. Um, it, it, the only way my life makes any sense whatsoever is if I am a direct descendant of Murphy. You've heard of Murphy's Law. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Yeah, it's, um, that, that seems to be you know, the mantra that describes my life. Right. 
So I, I'm the first to understand that life happens, you're going to get sick, you're going to have family problems, that sort of thing. Um, but it, I have a policy with regard to missed assignments because I've had problems way at the end of the semester with students coming up to me and saying I missed the first quiz. Like in our case, that would be missing a January quiz and trying to address it in April. And it's just, I've, I've posted the answer key, uh, it's been too long, um, it bungs up the, uh, the entire flow of the course, that sort of thing. Um, so that, that, that can't happen. We've got to attend to, if there's a problem, we've got to solve the problem when the problem arises. So I have this policy. Um, in the unfortunate event that you miss an assignment uh, uh, date uh, due to a uh, serious illness or a death in the family, you must notify me, that is by email, by telephone message with the departmental office, um, somehow get in touch with me. All right. Either before the date and uh, time in question, which is preferable, or within 12 hours of the deadline or due date. Otherwise, I will not be able to offer an extension. Um, and provided you're not in some sort of a coma, uh, this should be very doable. All right. So if life happens, if you get in a car accident, if um, you, you have a pet that has to go into the pet hospital, um, if you are deathly sick with flu, there's a bad one going around Michigan right now, um, it, you know, it, let me know and we can work something out, right? Um, just last semester, I had a student contact me towards the end of the semester saying, well, I missed quiz two. Well, that was October, it's December now, right? So it's, it had to contact me in October, there, there would have been something we could work out. But is, since it's December, it's too late, right? So anyhow, again, I'm not asking for the, earth, the, the sun and the moon, but, um, you know, just, just so if something happens, just contact me within 12 hours or before the time in question. Uh, there will be an email record of it or some sort of record of it, and we'll work something out. Cool? Cool. Okay, email. Um, so uh, the first thing I want to point out is that sometimes I email someone across the hall from me and it takes four hours to get there. All right? So it's not necessarily instant. All right? it's sometimes it gets stuck in the cloud somewhere before it comes to you. All right? So it um, should be noted that email is not a form of instant communication. Um, it, it, beside that, there are a lot of people. And I sometimes have trouble keeping up with emails. So it's, it's important to note that I will do my best to answer your emails in a timely fashion. But due to the high volume of emails associated with these, especially online courses, um, I do fall behind from time to time. Um, it also, sometimes I miss emails right, because I'm juggling a lot of data via email. Right? Um, so if you have um, any questions uh, about the course, about your, your assessments, anything along those lines, the best and most direct manner for these questions to arise is in person, that is um, in office hours, or it doesn't really make sense in class because this is in class right now, so, um, and it's a one-way form of communication here. Uh, but nonetheless, I have uh, uh, on-campus office hours. I also have a phone in my office that I can be reached at via the switchboard. All right, so if you can't make it to my office hours, call me during my office hours. Call the departmental office. Um, all of that info is on the web page. Um, then they will transfer you, and uh, away we go. All right, so. Um, if I have a number of similar emails, uh, questions regarding course material or procedure, I frequently send out a mass email to everyone addressing that question. So um, yeah, I'm not ignoring you. It's just a matter of if I have 10 emails all asking me the same question, I probably have 40 students with that same question. So I email everybody so everybody's got it. I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm just trying to be as, as, as fair and efficient as possible. 
Um, one more little point about um, email. Oakland University likes to take possession of things, so Oakland University requires that all course correspondence should occur through an o OU email account. So if you're, you Yahoo or me.com or um, uh, what else, Gmail, uh, Hotmail, if anybody still uses that, um, uh, I'm not supposed to respond because all correspondence has to be done through an OU email account, right? Um, so um, it, it, it activate that OU email account and email me via that email address, right? That's that's the one that's automatic. That's the one that knows who you are, too, so that I can keep track of who's who and what's where. So um, there's that. Uh, discussion forum content policy. Again, I've had problems in the past with people making def it, it sort of um, inflammatory comments on the discussion. It don't keep it classy is the idea. Um, it's intended as an instructional resource and uh, not a more general forum. Right? It's not Facebook. You don't talk about your weekend on it. Um, it's not Twitter. You don't post anything that crosses your mind on it. It's supposed to be devoted to uh, the material at hand, and uh, what's more, if you have any sort of abusive or inflammatory or derogatory kind of comments that post, those comments will be removed and all assess some sort of a penalty uh, there. So the idea is to um, keep it classy. And um, questions like, when are we getting our grades back, or how did everybody else do on that exam, um, don't belong there either. Right? So keep it topical as well. So, um, just in terms of a general policy, um, that's the way it goes. And in terms of that extra credit, I always have questions about extra credit. Um, problem with extra credit is, is that the people who already have four points get better four points out of it. The four point is already a four point. I can't assign any higher. It's, it, there are big problems with grade inflation with extra credit. Um, you, I don't do it anymore. Um, Watch your grades. There are lots of ways to maximize um, your utilization of the grades at hand. Uh, so before anybody even asks, no extra credit. Right? Everybody is on the same page and getting a grade out of a, the same possible hundred points in the class. So um, those are the policies. Again, I don't want to be a jerk, uh, but it's just necessary for the efficient, effective sort of flow of the course that we keep these policies in mind. Um, if you have questions about them, contact me. Right. Um, so, uh, boop, 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 boop. Uh, you have a tentative reading schedule. Um, week one is uh, the syllabus, this video, and print it, read it over, that sort of thing. Uh, the reading schedule also, it's, um, I have a calendar that everything is marked on. It's probably good if you um, mark all of your due dates uh, in the important dates section on page three on this calendar as well. Um, so I leave that to you to follow. Um, and finally, take a look um, at the grading scheme on the last page of the syllabus. I provide you with a letter grade to percentage point uh, conversion chart uh, that's probably a little different than what you are um, used to. Uh, for example, my A range, A minus starts at 80 and A plus ends at 100. So it's that top 20% for an A, not the top 10%. So um, what I do when I calculate your final grade is I change that percentage grade into a letter grade and then by the chart at the bottom here, um, which I get from the office, the register, change that letter grade into a GPA four-point grade. So um, this is just so that we're communicating effectively. Uh, so when I say you got an 8 out of 10 on a quiz, you know that's an A minus and you shouldn't freak out. Um, when you get a 7 out of 10, you know that's a B minus, and uh, that's actually still a fairly good grade. Um, so uh, that's what that means. Um, this last page is here because I used to be confronted by students in tears in the parking lot and have to sort of talk them off the wall kind of thing. So um, this should be an interesting course. Um, I try to illustrate using sort of conversational or anecdotal or contemporary examples 
Um, the first thing I'll be posting is some background material on the pre-Socratics. It's a little older video, but nonetheless, um, I like the way that I introduced sort of a tension that sets up Socrates and it introduces philosophy general to you as well, because I know for many, this is your introduction to philosophy, of course, as well. So um, I'm looking forward to an interesting semester, and uh, please contact me if you have any questions whatsoever, and um, I look forward to interacting virtually with all of you. Right. Cheers.